I'm very pleased this morning to introduce Charles Lewis as our first speaker. Charles founded the Center for Public Integrity in 1989 and served as its executive director until January of 2005. He's the founding president of the Fund for Independence Journalism, a support organization for the Center for Public Integrity, and he's a professor and founding executive editor of the Investigative Reporting Workshop at the American University School of Communication in Washington, D.C., where he's currently a distinguished journalist in residence and a professor of journalism. For 11 years, Charles did investigative reporting at ABC News and at CBS News as a producer for 60 Minutes. He then moved on to begin the Center for Public Integrity, a nonprofit, nonpartisan watchdog organization that investigates political influence and corruption and really should be on everyone's bookmark list. So if it's not, be sure to mark publicintegrity.org. Just as an example, this week you're looking at headlines there about reports on lobbyists and donation bundling, security risks at U.S. chemical plants, and security risks at U.S. mass transit systems, and raises questions about the Rainy Day Foundation Mortgage Protection Program. There is fabulous stuff on that site. Under Charles's leadership, the center published roughly 300 investigative reports, including 14 books, and its work was honored more than 30 times by national journalism organizations. He himself received the Penn USA's 2004 First Amendment Award for, quote, expanding the reach of investigative journalism for his courage in going after a story regardless of whose toes he steps on and for boldly exercising his freedom of street speech and freedom of the press. In 2001, he created a center project to report on corruption and government accountability around the world and utilized 200 social scientists and investigative reporters in 25 countries for that project. It resulted in the groundbreaking Global Integrity Report and ultimately a new international nonprofit called Global Integrity. Charles is co-author of five books, including the national bestseller, The Buying of the President, 2004. He serves on a number of boards, including our very own board of the Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism. He's a longtime member of Investigative Reporters and Editors, the Committee to Protect Journalists, and the National Press Club. And it all started when he was just 17 years old, working nights in the sports department of the Wilmington, Delaware News Journal. So you never know where it's going to go when you start in the news department, huh? Please welcome Charles Lewis. That seems like a long way ago, uh, <laughs> that's all I can say. Um, anyway, it's a terrific pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Kathy. Um, Congratulations, Stephen, on what you have uh, built here. Uh, uh, this is a desperate need for the Center for Journalism Ethics, and I'm, I'm delighted to participate in this, as we have done earlier this year. Um, and I'm also a proud, uh, very proud board member of the Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism. I don't know if Andy Hall is here. Uh, hey, Andy. And uh, lots of other friends in the audience. Uh, uh, Brant Houston and John Sawyer and others. Um, uh, this is uh, this is always a tricky subject uh, to talk about. Uh, uh, when I ran the Center for Public Integrity, I was always excoriating politicians for their ethics or lack thereof, mostly in terms of be reacting. To, after we did our studies, the media would ask what it all meant, and um, I, I've never really. Uh, set out to talk about journalism ethics per se, just to be clear. Part of the problem with ethics discussions uh, is that it has an eat your broccoli uh, quality to it uh, that, that uh, is kind of uh, tricky. So, um, and, and honestly, journalists are a little bit uh, thin skinned, of course. Uh, I'm shocked that, you're, that I would say that, I know. But, um, so, so, anyway, I'm going to make a few observations and then we'll do questions. Um, I, um, you know, basically, before we go deep into nonprofits, I just want to point out that ethics issues with commercial media for profits have been a, has been an issue since the 1700s. Hiding the money, hiding the owners, uh, slamming other people without telling who was doing it or who was behind it. This is 
what, some of the issues we're going to talk about are, I'm not remotely suggesting that they are new, but, but what we do have here is a new situation, which I, now I'm going to set this stage for describing that. Um, essentially, as you all, we all know too painfully well, there's been a crisis in journalism where news consumption has been going down for half a century, uh, actually in North America and in, uh, in Europe and in parts of Asia. And uh, as you also know too painfully that in the last uh, 15 years, one third of America's newsrooms have disappeared. And um, what has occurred, so it's, we all know how desperate that is. We know that most cities like Philadelphia and other cities in America have half as many reporters today as they had in the 1980s. Uh, it means that certain subjects aren't being covered the way they should be, uh, on and on and on. So th that is the crisis we've all been living through. What is utterly remarkable is the response to the crisis. It is not coincidental that um, today we have, and I don't know the exact number, and I'm sheepish to tell you I don't know the exact number because they're proliferating like rabbits, but we have something in the range of anywhere from 35 to 50 uh, nonprofits uh, that have cropped up all over the United States. Some of them were there and we didn't notice them or we didn't regard it as journalism, which I, I'm happy to go deep on if you want to. Um, <clears throat> groups that do investigative research that happens to be publishing on the web now, which means they're all nonprofit news publishers. Uh, but they also have done books over the years. Uh, folks like the National Security Archive and Center for Responsive Politics, uh, with all of its volumes on open secrets um, um, and, and um, some other groups uh, track transactional records access clearinghouse by David Burnham, the fellow who broke the Serpico story and many, many other stories in his distinguished career. So those are nonprofits that were around for decades, but we didn't really view them as even journalistic. They were research organizations, but in fact, they were all substantially built up by journalists and what they're doing is certainly journalistic. It's investigative, it's research, and it is also uh, narrative prose about the subject. So, I guess we would call that journalism. And so, um, uh, in terms of nonprofit investigative reporting entities, uh, the first one, well, let's freeze frame it for a minute. Nonprofit journalism has a long history. Associated Press was created in 1846. Throughout the 20th century, you have the Christian Science Monitor, uh, National Geographic, with somewhere between, uh, at one point, it was seven or eight million readers, it may be down to five or six million. But, uh, many, many of these types of publications uh, in the 60s, actually late 60s, you had National Public Radio and uh, Public Broadcasting System. The only news organization in America to double its audience in the last decade is National Public Radio. Um, and so, so right off the bat, we have to also say nonprofits are not new. <laughs> I'm just trying to give the full universe of, of the landscape here. Uh, it's, it's an interesting landscape. It has always been interesting, but it suddenly got much more interesting. Um, in 1977, um, a couple different things happened. Uh, a new magazine was created called Mother Jones a Magazine out on the West Coast. And to get, because of the postal rates were cheaper, they made themselves a nonprofit, not a for profit magazine. Three years later, or roughly two to three years later, the center, around the same time essentially, the Center for Investigative Reporting was created as the first investigative reporting center that, it, that anyone knows of at least. Uh, even that's, uh, I have all these footnotes, I'm going to keep moving here. Uh, center for Investigative Reporting. Uh, there's a long muckraking tradition of solo practitioners. George Seldes within FACT, of course I have Stone with his I have Stones Weekly, but those are actually, I believe they were for profits that we, we, we call them low profit like almost no profit, <laughs> but, so, but the idea of adventuresome investigative reporter types uh, itching to uh, investigate the bastards, that's a long tradition too. Uh, but the entrepreneurialism that became nonprofit constructs, 501c3 uh, educational institutions sanctioned by the Internal Revenue Service or within universities, um, that's a relatively new phenomenon. So Lowell Bergman uh, of the insider movie fame who is played by Al Pacino and still thinks he's Al Pacino. Uh, he's a good friend. He went to University of Wisconsin, I should point out. Uh, um, Lowell and uh, uh, three other fellows, uh, uh, Dan Noyes, David Weir, and uh, Henry Weinstein, I think, were the first, the four founders. 
And they founded the Center for Investigative Reporting in Northern California for one simple reason. They are all out of a job. And they, they wanted to find a different way to make money. Uh, I mean, there's nothing uh, uh, usually romantic about <laughs> the act of creation. It was a necessity to do it. Uh, the old cliche, necessity is the mother of invention. Fast forward to 1989, I got very frustrated at 60 Minutes as Mike Wallace's producer, and I uh, quit. I walked away from a, a four-year contract, and I had a mortgage and a family, and I, I, I don't recommend this to the students in the audience, uh, <laughs> uh, but I uh, started the Center for Public Integrity from my house. Uh, and, um, and again, it, it wasn't that I needed a job. I actually had a job, but then I had to do something else if I wasn't going to work there. <laughs> And uh, uh, so there were other nonprofits that followed uh, in the, the Philippines. Uh, nine women got together, Sheila Coronel and eight other women, and they, in the wake of uh, Fer Ferdinand Marcos and uh, that debacle, um, and they created the Philippine Center for Investigative Journalism. And years later, they brought down Joseph Estrada, the president of the Philippines. Uh, Sheila and her colleagues found out that the president of the country had five mistresses and he had built them all mansions worth millions of dollars and he was just a public servant, so gosh, where did he get that money? Uh, he was impeached and removed from office. Um, today, Sheila is at Columbia University teaching and she runs the Stabile Center, a nonprofit investigative entity within Columbia University, but she's a, a heroic figure. Um, somewhere in the mid-90s, we start to see uh, I'm sorry, in the early part of this decade, we start to see some activity. Voice of San Diego is created um, around approximately 2005. And then we start to see Min Post uh, by Joel Kramer, a former editor and former publisher at different times of the Minneapolis Star Tribune, creates Min Post and, uh, in 07, I think. And then you start to see a sort of a floodgate thing going on. Um, um, and I, I, I just spl split them up in the types of nonprofits. You have university-based nonprofits. As far as I can tell, the first university-based nonprofit doing investigative reporting in the United States, I think, was David Prodes uh, with the Medill Innocence Project. Um, he began looking into whether or not people should really be executed based on evidence that was there or not there. In 1992, the Innocence Project itself became formalized as part of Medill in 1999. Today, there are 50 five zero innocence projects. These are journalism schools with students working with law schools across America. Well, those are nonprofits, <laughs> and they're doing serious journalism. And movies, documentaries, books, lots of hundreds, thousands of news articles have come from that work. Um, you also then uh, have Lowell Bergman started his program out in the early part of uh, this decade, I think. Um, uh, somewhere around 03, 04, he starts to have the investigative reporting program. He has a quasi-endowed chair, and he starts to have fellowships for students, and they're partnering with the New York Times and Frontline. In 04, Bergman wins uh, every sing single award you can win. Uh, if there's something beyond a trifecta, I'm not quite sure. I'm not a horse guy, but you know, he had the Pulitzer, the Peabody, uh, uh, the Emmys, the... Uh, everything you could do because it was a documentary and it was with the New York Times. That's with students from Berkeley. Uh, you had Walter Robinson, a great Boston Globe reporter working with grad students at Northeastern University. But actually before him you had Florence Graves who is the founder of Common Cause magazine that won the National Magazine Award in 1987 and she, she basically uh, uh, also exposed the Packwood scandal, uh, and he was removed from office, many other things. She has the Schuster Institute for Investigative Journalism at Brandeis uh, University. Um, and um, in, after I left the Center for Public Integrity, I started the Investigative Reporting Workshop at American in uh, 08, and today we have a staff of approaching 14 people with another six or eight part-timers, and we're a co-production uh, partner with Frontline, as is Berkeley. And uh, so now there are, I'd say, approximately, and of course I, didn't, I mentioned earlier the Wisconsin Center, and also the New England Center was created also in 08 or 09, a New England Center for Investigative Reporting at Boston University. The Wisconsin Center here is a, a 501c3, 
standalone, but at offices at a university. The New England Center is within Boston University under the School of Communications. Then there's the Watchdog Institute, created by a longtime 25-year veteran of the U Union Tribune in San Diego, former Neiman Fellow, Lori Hearn. And, and that is part of the San Diego State University at the moment, but will have its C3 status. So what I'm getting at, so there's a university model where you incorporate students uh, doing the work so it's not hieroglyphics, the, this profession that lives on, um, and funding coming in externally. These centers have to rise and fall on their own weight financially. Uh, but then you have the other centers. So after the Center for uh, Public Integrity, uh, um, in, as you all know, in 2008, at, at the national level, ProPublica was created, uh, which of course just shared a Pulitzer Prize with the New York Times. Um, the other thing that started to happen, for those of you who are curious how this all happened, in 2000, uh, at the end of 2000, uh, I guess it was 2008, the Pulitzer Prizes were opened up to n n online news publishers for the first time, not just newspapers. That was a s significant seismic decision. The second thing is Associated Press uh, uh, announced it would have four nonprofit partners making the content available to all their client uh, newspapers last year in 2009, uh, Center for Public Integrity, Investigative Reporting Workshop, ProPublica, and the Center for Investigative Reporting. And now you have ProPublica winning the Pulitzer Prize. So this, this ascendance has been going on gradually, but it is clearly here. <laughs> I mean, and that's why we're having this conversation. Sorry to go on so much about it, but I wanted to lay it out because it's sort of a, been a strange journey to watch all of this, uh, uh, to say the least. Um, so, so we know that there was a crisis, and what I just said I would characterize as the good news uh, here. Um, and, and one other thing I should mention, the new system now, when I ran the Center for Public Integrity, I had 35 news conferences, and I would release all the reports basically to the media as a jump ball, and like in basketball. And uh, two-thirds of the news conferences were on C-SPAN, sometimes live, and uh, we got a, you know, a lot of 10,000 news articles about our work over the years, including all TV outlets. Um, but the new model today, I don't know exactly why, I'm just telling you, <laughs> the new model. The new model today is mostly collaboration, direct co collaboration. The winnowed newsrooms need content. The new online publishers need eyeballs for their websites. And so there's a natural confluence and partnership that has gone on. Many of the people, uh, and this is actually the coolest part of the story, the diaspora of immensely talented journalists who had nowhere to work and didn't want to leave the profession have become founders and even publishers. These are rank and file journalists for the most part who basically were doing their thing inside a large newsroom and they've all now, many of the ones, the founders of these groups, uh, who I basically know at this point all of them, I think, um, they have left their the previous world because frankly they had to leave because of the commercial crisis. And, they, and so they have created this new construct. And the famous quote by A.J. Liebling, the only free press is the one you own. Well, most journalists are not independently wealthy. So if you can't own it, why don't you start a nonprofit? That's, <laughs> that's sort of what has happened here. So the collapse of the commercial media and necessity being the mother of invention with these journalists is the out, a direct relation between those two events. Three or four of the 35 or so or more nonprofits were started by the people with money. Uh, ProPublica was actually started by the funders. Uh, Texas Tribune, in, in a really interesting new group started last year, was started by uh, the, the biggest venture capitalist in the state of Texas, uh, John Thornton. Um, and, and there are a few other cases where the funder said, uh, Warren Hellman right now in California, Northern California, has thrown down five million a year. and um, and he basically now has hired people to do what he would like them to do. I mean, they want to do it too, of course. But <laughs> the idea actually emanated from the funders. And in, in, in the minority of cases, I would say less than 10% of the cases, you do have funders getting excited and doing this, but actually founding things. But usually it's, it's bootstraps up. And Joel Kramer is the only journalist I know who's been an editor and a publisher at a major newspaper, besides before Steiger came in, the ProPublica, who also then came over and became an executive also in a nonprofit setting. Most of it is rank and file, working, stiff, 
journalists. <laughs> There's a little bit of a class thing going on. You know, all the people that railed against the suits in their newsrooms now have become the suits <laughs> themselves, <laughs> running their nonprofits. And so all these issues are fascinating, but they explain this subject now about ethics. Because you have a lot of people who have never really managed anything. When I started the center, I had never managed anybody in my life. I would never raised a penny in my life. I would never managed money in my life. This is a bad combination to, <laughs> to, be, to be an entrepreneur. And so uh, uh, and, uh, this is another for those uh, young people. Uh, be careful on that one. Um, but but uh, it, sometimes you get lucky. And, and uh, you know, fear is, as Mike Wallace has often said, fear is a great motivator, <laughs> fear of failure. Um, so, so that's the landscape. Now, um, I have been utterly fascinated by this landscape that has emerged. I've, been, I've written 11 or 12 articles since 07. Um, I had a Shorenstein Fellowship up at Harvard, and I was asked, well, I was asked, you have to actually do something for that fellowship. And uh, <laughs> naturally, I would get the one where you have to do a lot of work. Um, uh, and, and so the only thing I really knew to write about firsthand was about nonprofit journalism. And so I wrote a 17,000 word paper about the growing importance of nonprofit journalism. And I've been tracking things fairly closely since, not really from an ethics standpoint, really just from what's going on here. What's it mean? Where is it going? So um, I have, I'm about to publish, I, I have an iLab part of the investigative reporting workshop. We're trying to incubate new models to enlarge the public space. Believe it or not, we're looking at nonprofits. We've already spun out, <clears throat> excuse me, a new nonprofit by a, a great journalist on the West Coast who has his own C3, looking at health and consumer issues, uh, uh, Myron Levin, uh, and I'm on the board with him, and that's great. But we're also looking at for-profit models and hybrid L3C corporate. So there's all these new models also being discussed that are not just the C3. Just so you're aware, that's all happening too. But one of the things we're looking at is we're going to put up uh, something called the new journalism ecosystem, and we're going to put up a, a detailed description of every, uh, what we think is every major credible nonprofit doing public service journalism, both investigative or in-depth explanatory journalism. CJR, Columbia Journalism Review, which I'm a contributing editor uh, of, is also separately going to do something. This May-June issue coming out any minute basically is going to have a list with information like that. I think we have slightly different, different questions we ask of the groups. Um, mine is uh, not quite finished, uh, but I thought I would mention some of the observations, and we'll get right to the, the ethics issues I think that we need to talk about. One is, uh, I mean, we're talking about one of the issues is transparency, is this talk, right? I think the official talk is uh, uh, transparency standards and practices. So let's start with transparency. Um, uh, there is an issue because people don't really know about these nonprofits and the fact that they have tax exempt status from the IRS. And, and if they're a new group, no one knows who the hell they are. <laughs> There's all these reasons to have transparency. It's obvious, I think. At least it seems obvious. Um, um, so here's what I looked into 35 groups, actually, and I've only tallied stuff for 30 groups. And this is not official. But of course, it's on the web, so I guess it's sort of official. Uh, so I, I want to caution, these are not hard and firm numbers. They are going to change as I do my, my own fact checking. This is very, very extremely rough. But it'll give you a flavor of this landscape. It's really fascinating, I think. To me, it is, uh, at least. Uh, of the 30 groups that I looked at, some of these are the research groups I mentioned that have been here before that we don't, have never heretofore acknowledged as journalistic, frankly. Uh, I think the whole epidemiology of investigative information in our society has to be really thought about carefully because we've always not acknowledged where this stuff comes from, and now we're starting to realize, oh, they're nonprofits, oh, they're they're journalists, oh, they're they're publishing. Uh, so we never did that. So anyway, I looked at 30 groups who have approximately 350 full-time staff. Uh, so we're not talking about this supplanting the commercial media, okay? This is, there's a specialist doing this spe special stuff, investigative public service journalism. 350 full-time staff. 330 of them uh, have prior professional experience. Uh, so that means the diaspora did move over into these nonprofits. That means that 9 out of 10, roughly, well, I don't know the exact numbers, but you get what I'm saying, roughly 90%. Uh, of these groups are journalists trying to do journalism. Uh, there's very little overhead. They don't have trucks. 
They don't have printing presses. They don't have the money for them, but they also don't spend it on that. They're just doing the journalism, and it's really mostly for the salaries is the money. Um, but that's all very interesting. But here's where the ethics part comes in. 25 of the 30 that I, now again, I'm, these are rough figures, but 25 of the 30 groups I looked at uh, did disclose their donors, the major donors at least on their website. Um, but it gets a little bit more interesting on, on further. Five of the 30, uh, uh, only five of the 30 post their IRS 990 form, the annual form that you're required as a nonprofit to tell the IRS everything, your operating budget, your salaries of your senior people, how your operating budget is actually expended, what exactly you spent the money on, and other things. Um, the closest thing to a glimpse into an operation that you can get as a public document is the 990. Five out of 30 post their 990s. That means, well, that means we don't have a lot of transparency about what's going on inside these groups. Uh, at least eight of those ones not doing it are within universities, and they all say, um, they would include the Investigative Reporting Workshop at American. We're part of American University. American's a nonprofit, so they file a 990. But there's it's 850 faculty, and it's a big monstrosity you know, university. Good luck figuring out in that 990 the little tiny Investigative Reporting Workshop out of all the employees. So we have taken a step at the Investigative Reporting Workshop of putting up the salaries of the top people and our operating budget information because we. We, um, we don't really have a 990 to give because the university does it, but we do believe the public has, an has a reasonable uh, need to know more about who we are and what we're about, and we have no issue with that. Um, so um, there's ways to get around that, but I must say uh, virtually all the university centers don't have their 990s up, and m with the exception of what I just said, um, no one else goes to any additional step to put that information on their websites. So there's a, a serious issue there. The other one, and this is one that I'm grappling with myself, actually, which is ironic because you think I'm an old dog who knows everything but, about this, but I don't. Uh, six or seven out of 30 have editorial policies, what their editorial policy and process is. Only six or seven out of 30 put that up on their sites. At the investigative reporting workshop, we're having a knockdown, drag out fight. It's kind of fun in a sick kind of way. Um, uh, uh, about uh, what should be the policies and standards regarding very uh, those uh, the old canards of the profession, like a use of anonymous sources. Um, uh, my good friend Jim Risen, the great investigative reporter at the New York Times, has just found out in the last day or two that he's been subpoenaed. Uh, uh, by the Obama administration to reveal his sources next Tuesday in my city where I live, Alexandria, Virginia, in the grand jury. Um, you can't do national security without, it, without uh, sources. <laughs> Hello, you know, <laughs> they don't issue press releases, and if they do, you shouldn't read them. Uh, and so, so um, I happen to think you need these sources, but of course the, they've always been overused in Washington, uh, I think it's pretty obvious. Um, so how do you do it? So we're, we're bringing in a, a professor at American who has a PhD and a law degree who's going to do a Socratic thing with the staff and we're going to try to weigh what it should be and it's going to be a group decision. Well, I mean, I'm in charge, but, but we're going to have something that we can all live with that'll go up on our site in the next few days, actually, we hope. Um, so, so those are issues. Okay, so what are the best practices? I think they're kind of obvious. Uh, disclose your 990s as nonprofits. I think that's fairly essential. Uh, disclose, if you don't do that, or uh, it, should be, it would be in there if, if you disclose that, but if you don't, disclose your operating budget and top salaries um, as though you have done your 990. Um, disclose your donors, uh, and I don't just mean the two or three big ones. I actually think anyone who gives money over a certain level those levels vary for every group, and, and even the sensibility about what you disclose has changed over the years. What, you can set it at 200, you can do it at 500, some people do it at 5,000 and up, the, whatever. The point is we need to know what's going on there. Um, I think the biographies of the staff are very important uh, because it tells me, is this a fly-by-night operation that's trying to masquerade as journalists, or are they really journalists, or who are these people? Do they have a reputation? Who are they? What would they do in the past? Um, I think that's important to know in general. Uh, I think that about for-profit news publishers too, by the way, not just non-profit, but I think that's important. It gives us evidence of their seriousness. Uh, 
Um, and and um, and this may sound crazy, but awards. Um, awards are not just for PR for a website. It actually tells me there's been a peer review and recognition process of the work that that has been on this site over a period of months or years. I think it's useful to know this is a respected entity within the profession. Um, does that mean that, that if you do all these things, you won't have any charlatan-type operations? Uh, no, unfortunately. <laughs> but it helps mitigate against that. Um, we, we have a, 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 an awkward situation here going on. It's not surprising. We live in Hatfield versus the McCoys, America here where we've been screaming at each other as a country for the last 10 or 15 years, the most intractable period in U.S. history since the 1880s. And, and so a lot of things that go on in, of course, the blogosphere but all, and the web in general has to do with uh, the two parties and, their, and liberal and conservative groups that are tied to those parties. And there's been a, a problem in, along the nonprofit sector. There have been folks who have been journalists but been, have also been close to one or two, one or the other parties. So in around 06, in the 06 to 07 period, their liberals and conservatives have created groups that walk like a duck and sound like a duck, but are maybe opposition research uh, substantially masquerading as something resembling journalism. And so that's why these things are important. I mean, if you want to go deep on the groups and who they are, there have been articles written about these various groups. But one of the hallmarks for at least some of them is not disclosing their donors. Why? Because they're getting money from interests that instantly reveal where it's, who they're really working for. Uh, and so um, I think it's better if we have an open discussion about other things than going into that. But if you want to know about it, I'm happy to talk about it. But it's really a, dis a dis difficult situation involving pre press credentialing in America, the old-fashioned way with galleries. It's a, what, how is a, who is a legitimate journalist? And by the way, do we, we don't really want the government telling us who that is. And no one, journalists have always been proud that they don't have any standards, basically. Uh, doctors, and, doctors and lawyers have standards. Journalists say, well, we certainly have standards, but it's always been a little difficult sometimes to see exactly what they are. And, and uh, now it's more important than ever that we actually have a sense of who is a real journalist at least what are they doing, and at least know something about these people. And so um, I think that as this uh, new ecosystem continues to develop, and I do predict that between now and the next year or two, there will be 50 to 100 of these nonprofits. And some of us in this room are involved, uh, three or four of us in this, in this room are part of a new investigative news network that is a, the first attempt to syndicate content investigative and public service journalism content. No one has ever attempted to do that in a significant, large way. We're about to hire a CEO, and we've raised money for it, and stay tuned. So the economic model may change, because syndication is starting to show some small but interesting signs of life in, with certain groups right now with investigative content. Now people are so desperate for actual, serious, real, correct content that is suddenly valuable. It's slightly like a Woody Allen movie there, but you know, we, I thought it was valuable for a long time, but <laughs> we're, the market is starting to think that maybe there's some uh, a usefulness for content and maybe people would even pay a, at least something for it. So I'm gonna stop there, but um, I, because I think the conversation is much more fun than somebody yammering, but this landscape is a, a thrilling uh, landscape to behold and um, I didn't mention all the world. I mean, these are happening all over the world. There's nonprofits cropping up right now. I was in Japan in December, uh, 100 reporters at the Japan National Press Club. They're starting, uh, they're going to try to do a university based nonprofit center at one of the universities right in Tokyo. And now we're going to have a second straight year of uh, Japanese journalists just hanging out at our workshop trying to figure out maybe what, how to do the same thing back there. In Jordan, I, uh, in November, spoke to 200 journalists from 14 countries. Uh, uh, the Arab Reporters for Investigative Journalism. I mean, think about that a minute. Um, you know, in, uh, in Oman, Jordan, <laughs> of all places, uh, uh, and it's, it's, it's a really incredible thing to even attempt. But remember those Danish cartoons that were so offensive? The Danish government was kind of sheepish about the whole thing, so they threw millions of dollars into creating a, a thing that would essentially foster this kind of a more critical uh, accountability journalism even in that region and it's actually starting to take off to some extent and so 
uh, uh, Gustavo Garidi, who was kicked out of Panama and disappeared for several days, kidnapped by Fujimori and Montesino in Peru, is starting a nonprofit in Peru. I could go on and on and on, but they, these, they're now in 10 to 20 countries around the world, also increasing right now. Uh, the Bureau of Investigative Journalism started last summer in London, on and on and on. So uh, this is not just a U.S. phenomenon, and that's why these issues are so, is so essential that we figure out, because this is not going away. It's going to be here. It's already been here for 20 or 30 years, but it's actually, I think, going to be here for much, much longer. We don't know what else is going to happen with the commercial media. And we all hope things get figured out there, but there's a good chance it won't happen for a few years. And so we, this, is our, this is where we're going to get increasingly the most significant high quality journalism is going to occur in the sphere I just described, less so than the, comm the heretofore commercial realm. And so uh, we better figure out how to make it accountable. So I'll stop there. Thank you and happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you. No? Yep. Yes, there. I just I have to eat it apparently. Um, <laughs> a reminder that for questions, please wait till you have a microphone. And if there are any questions, please just indicate. Also, Katie, if there's any questions coming through, let me know. Um, you head back here. Um, please remember to state your name and um, where you're from, if you'd be so kind. Thank you. Um, Who's on? I'm Scott Cohn. I work for CNBC and uh, alum here. Um, how disclosing the donors is is one thing and important. How does your group and how do the other nonprofits keep the donors' influence out of what you report? How do they how do they mitigate those conflicts? Uh, it's a great question, and uh, it's a question that we discussed. I think uh, there was a recent event uh, a few months ago. We got into this, and it's logical. And I didn't mean not to talk about it. There's so much to talk about. Each group has to, I think that each group should also have standards internally about how they, how they deal with this. Let me just say, most groups rely on the founder or the executive director or whatever they call the head person to find the money. It's a burden and a very, very difficult thing. I raised $30 million in 15 years and I had people helping me do it, but I was the one, they all wanted to meet the founder. So um, groups therefore, these sort of idiosyncratic see the pants groups, honestly, we're not talking IBM here. Uh, uh, basically then trust the leader to do the right thing. The board trusts, the board which was basically concocted by the founder or at least invited initially. I mean, it's not like they didn't know each other, okay? The board. So you have this situation, it's insular where there's not a lot of introspection about what you just asked. And uh, there is discussion by the board, and every board meeting I, I was part of for 15 years at the center, every single one, so that's twice a year, 30 board meetings, we talked about your question, okay? Uh, what, who should we take money from? Who should we not? What's the process? How do we make sure there's not undue influence? So uh, maybe I didn't uh, uh, jump right in and mention it earlier because I'm weary of, of, <laughs> of the issue. Uh, what you do are several things. I think you try to make a wall, as you do in commercial media, between uh, the, the journalism part of the operation and the business development operational part, HR, all that, that stuff. So, um, or it's like a weekly newspaper where the editor is the publisher. And so like, I, that's what I was, essentially. So I, I was co-writing the books, and I was doing some of the studies, and I was approving all the, all the copy, all the editorial work being done. But I'm also personally out talking to donors. So. Unfortunately, one of the board members referred to our policy of the answer to your question of in Chuck we trust, which is a bad thing to say. But, but I mean, I'd like to tell you that that's very unusual, but in fact it's not unusual. Most groups do not have a, a statement or a policy. I mean, they'll have a, they might have a development policy, not in their first year, not in their second. They're trying to survive and they just haven't gotten that far. You have to make, some of it's common sense, but the, the obvious one is separate the journalism from the act of raising money, it, the same way that newspapers have done for over well over 100 years at least, uh, or tried, not always successfully also. Um, the second thing is anyone, I'm always suspicious of anybody that wants to give me money, like over, out over the transom, because it's so un, unlike the real world. 
<laughs> no one ever wants to give you money usually, and if they do, you better you better watch it carefully there. <laughs> it's not hold on to your wad, it's hold on to your soul. You know what I'm saying? Uh, be careful there. And I, I've had a, some slightly hilarious, but not so hilarious situations where people were trying to manipulate me and dump large sums of money. And, and I had people on my staff that were sorely tempted. Uh, uh, and we we duked it out uh, verbally, internally, and I just didn't feel right. And, and so you've got to use your instincts. Uh, generally, it should be your idea what the project is. Obvi and these are obvious common sense things, but the project should emanate from within. It should not emanate from without, from outside. And you, it should be your idea. You should be wary of anyone who wants to give you money that you maybe didn't ever know before. Uh, <laughs> Um, again, this is real basic stuff, but is it ever, is there a bill of rights or, you know, like a, co a codified thing about what I just said, not rights, but, you know, rules to live by? No one has ever really done a really good, that's probably a project uh, for us to talk about and think about. There are there certain obvious things you can do to mitigate against undue influence. The best thing a group has going for it, so th that needs to be done. There are certain things I've mentioned that are obvious, but um, the ultimate thing is uh, that also helps because you're not always, investigative reporting has a way of really ticking people off. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. And so you're, you're not running for office here. You're not trying to please the public. Uh, but, uh, but ultimately within the professional journalism, within serious folks who do this work, eventually you'll be seen as serious and not pandering to certain interests. You'll be seen as doing serious, great work and not just once, not a flash in the pan, but year in and year out. At some point, you're seen as those are the, those are the, they're the real deal. So that's not, that helps you at the back end, <laughs> building up a reputation, but you've got to do these other steps to get to a reputation. But together, that's how you build up credibility. It takes months and years. When I started the Center for Public Integrity from my house, all the good investigative reporting names were taken. Uh, the investigative reporters and editors, the Fund for Investigative Journalism, uh, uh, Center for Investigative Reporting, and so I thought the only thing I could think about was public integrity. All the stories I ever did had something to do with that, but I did then sound like a Lyndon LaRouche front group, you know, the Center for Public Integrity. I mean, of course we're all for public. What the hell does that mean? And, um, and you know, and I did it from my house, and then I was worried uh, some guy's doing something from his... I mean, so I was really worried about how I was perceived and positioning and all that, and I had a news conference a, a few after we did our first report, and I had always asked questions. I never took questions. And I had 35 reporters there with bifocals, you know, like this, and, you know, coming at me hard. It was on TV, C-SPAN, my very first news conference. We had a lot of coverage, and it worked out fine. We had, it made news all over the world, actually. It was about the revolving door with White House trade officials. But what I'm getting at is where you put your office. Do you put it on Capitol Hill? Does that mean you're a lobbyist? Do you put it on DuPont Circle? Does that mean you're a liberal? Do you put it out in the burbs? Does that mean you didn't have any money? Uh, <laughs> You know, everything you're doing is being watched. I mean, people are saying, who are these people? So I had distinguished people, Hiding Carter and Bill Kovach and uh, Father Hesburgh at Notre Dame and William Julius Wilson at Harvard and all kinds of interesting people on the advisory board who, who uh, people had heard of because they sure as hell hadn't heard of me. And, and you know, you're constructing a, an institution here. And so who is on your board, who's on your advisory board, where your office is? And, and what subjects you choose, all that's part of what you just asked. Because it's really about, it's the whole thing. It's not just, you can't just look at the donor part because the donors aren't going to actually give you money if they don't like all this other stuff or they don't respect it or unless they created it. There was a group a few years ago, I can't resist telling you this, I'm just frustrated I can't remember the name, but there was a, a Wall Street Journal story with these amazing numbers I never saw before about the impact, the, 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 the huge impact, like one of every five donations made in Washington were from trial lawyers or something. I'm exaggerating, but it was, the numbers didn't, I, I've done three buying of the president books. These numbers did not sound right to anybody. And the group, no one had ever heard of the group. Well, there was a whistleblower inside. It was a phony group created by Philip Morris. And every time that, and they got Wall Street Journal to put it in a prominent place in their paper, and the Wall Street Journal had to issue a retraction and an apology to their readers. Um, so that group didn't last too long. They were up and down in a matter of a few months. But every time they talked to reporters about how great their report was, they direct billed Philip Morris. We know that because the guy leaked the books. So are there fly-by-night groups out there doing 
outrageous things? The answer is yes. Did that just start? No, it's been around for several decades, <laughs> but, it, but it's a problem. So I'll stop. Too long an answer. Sorry, but that's a deep, that's a, that's a big question you asked. Katie from the blogosphere. Does she have a mic? Sorry. Okay, sorry. Is that better? Yes. There we go. Okay. Um, so, in response to that, someone comments using your instincts leaves a lot of wiggle room for potentially desperate cash strapped nonprofit organizations. Should we be training young journalists to be aware of Greeks bearing gifts in addition to skepticism in their reporting work? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I, you know, the old cliche follow the money. The line that was not in All the President's Men in the book, but William Goldman, the screenwriter of All the President's Men, put it in the screenplay, and he's eternally proud of that fact. Uh, but all journalists live by the dictum, follow the money as they investigate corruption. Uh, but it should be reversed, and uh, follow the money, be wary of the money, be careful about the money, should be something that entrepreneurs starting out, nonprofits, or any journalism entity, uh, for profit, same thing. I mean, for years, the Moonies have uh, owned and run the Washington Times. Uh, um, that was maybe one of the reasons I didn't read the paper every day, but uh, there, there are some others. Um, but, <laughs> but I mean, I, you know, I think so, yeah, I think the money is relevant to who these folks are. And uh, that, that's, these are all platitudes. It, it gets down, the rubber meets the road when you look at the, the actual the stuff. You look at the reports that are done, you look at the journalists, and you look at the money and where it came from, how much it costs, how big it was. Um, all that stuff is all part of how you factor in and make these decisions. A lot of people now are also teaching. The Stanford Knight Fellows, this, I thought this was your question actually, the Stanford Knight Fellows program, they actually do have to do something for their fellowship now. Uh, uh, they actually, uh, I'm, uh, you'll have not see me going for my handkerchief here. Um, they have to uh, design, devise business models and become entrepreneurs themselves as though they were creating a new news organization themselves. Each Knight Fellow now has to do that when they get their Knight Fellowship. So now journalists are being asked to be entrepreneurs. That's actually an incredibly interesting thing in and of itself. And um, to MBAs of the world, that's probably a chilling thought uh, about journalists uh, who are notoriously not that familiar with money or management and all these other things. But I, I actually think we're in an age now where we're savvy about this where money comes from, how to deal with it, how to manage it, how to raise it, and how to maintain your credibility is kind of crucial, so. Wow. Back here? Yeah. I've learned you have to eat the microphone. There you go. And then please remember to introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, Herman Bauman, Green Line Strategies. Uh, I wondered of the, of the not-for-profit organizations that you've seen, do they, do they have written and posted policies related to, to donations and fundraising? And are there any organizations out there that offer uh, model of policies that, uh, that organizations may look at? Interestingly, to the second part of your question, the answer that's no. <laughs> there should be. I mean, that's why we're in the infancy here still of a new ecosystem. There, there is not model stuff that I'm aware of. I mean, what I was starting to try to show is what I think are some of the basics that should be done, but no one has, even what I, on that, we have, there's no one has put forward anything as a model. They, maybe you guys have done it recently and I missed it, but it's clearly getting ready to, to happen. Uh, but uh, this, most groups that have been around a few years, I shouldn't say most, some groups <laughs> have policies. Uh, we, the Center for Public Integrity went through all kinds of pretzel-like uh, things, literally, as I mentioned, every meeting. We, uh, when I was there at the end, the, 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 as it got bigger and bigger, at, uh, when I left the end of 04, our policies were we would not take money from companies, labor unions, political parties, uh, uh, governments, uh, just foundations and individuals, and we would disclose them. Um, I think just recently the center has changed that and opened it up also to be corporate corporations. Um, 
Uh, I wasn't on the board when that happened. But anyway, uh, but each group has their own, uh, some, some groups have policies like that up on their site. But as I mentioned, a lot of them, at least five of the 30 I mentioned, don't disclose their donors at all. So good luck seeing a policy if you don't even disclose your donors themselves. So it's very, very tricky, and it changes. Uh, and this is a big subject. We, you know, we, we were just talking about this in the last day or two <laughs> with the Wisconsin Center. And, and so because if you, if, you wanna, um, if you go so much for purity that you'll you know, be moving to the priesthood or something, um, you know, if you're so perfect and so pure, you're going to be just perfect and you're going to be totally broke. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, there's a real world and there's the perfect world. Do you, do you know what I'm saying? So uh, who exactly is perfect? I mean, I always used to say I wish I was really rich and we could just have mana from heaven and live on that. <laughs> but unfortunately, you have to actually find money from somewhere. And the foundations seem reasonable to me. They have agendas, too. I don't say that they don't. But the money, in most cases, is generationally removed. And, and their, their activities in lobbying and the political process are relatively minor compared to labor unions and companies. And so it's not perfect, but it's better than uh, the active participants. We initially did take money from labor unions and companies. And then I started investigating labor unions and companies. And uh, it's, it started to become apparent that this was not a good idea uh, <laughs> to take their money. I have a lot of scar tissue. Uh, whatever ethics I'm discussing here today was hard won, <laughs> and I still have a lot of scars to show for it. Um, similarly with anonymous gifts, we, again, this is a constant issue. Do you accept anonymous gifts? Uh, there are two issues there. Do you know the money, who it came from? But I'm talking about do you disclose the money is what I, when I say anonymous. I'm really talking about that. I, it's a long story, and we would run out of time. Uh, probably cause maybe other questions, but I'm for all for disclosing and not taking anonymous money. Um. Hi, Ellie Hi. Pick. I'm a alum of the J School here, and I'm also a recovering fundraiser. So oh. I have a question related to your uh, financial model. Who is, what is the profile of your ideal entrepreneur who will either invest in your idea or at least donate to it? Well, um, that they'd not ventured out of their house their entire life, not ever, <laughs> not ever joined a political party, uh, a complete eunuch when it comes to opinions, attitudes, or publicly expressed opinions and obscenely rich, billions of dollars, that <laughs> happens to love me. Uh, of course, I'm not describing the real world here. Um, uh, so I have been playful there, sorry. Um, uh, the, I mean, I think the ideal one, is, it's got to be a credible donor. That if it's a foundation, it's got to be somebody who's been around a while. That The problem with foundations is they change their missions every two or three years. I'm, maybe sometimes it's five years. But um, uh, they're no notorious for, at least in some, some of them, for being fickle. So some of them will support uh, a general thing like accountability or transparency or quality journalism for several years, and then some of them will stop after a while, and it makes it very tricky for fundraising purposes. Uh, the, that fickleness is irritating. Um, but I, I think the ideal is uh, also a lot of, from the, on the donor side, a lot of donors have not so great agendas, uh, and, and uh, some of them uh, are cagey about that and won't have revealed initially. Um, I could tell you lots of stories, you know, where uh, famous billionaires send their lawyers to meet with me, and then I find out who their client really is and all that stuff. You know, so anything that involves subterfuge, them giving me, as I said before, them giving me money over the transom, I'm suspicious of. But the ideal donor is the one. Uh, the center was doing a lot of over 300 reports. But we had a former New York Times reporter who had become rich. Maybe he was at born that way. I don't know. But he sent a check in for 25000 We didn't ask him for money. That's the ideal donor. So it's a journalist who became rich, who we never met, who sent a check. I'm sorry. I, I don't mean to be. Yeah, no, I, yeah, exactly. Uh, but I, I, I'm joking. But I mean, uh, that's the ideal donor is the one you don't, uh, you know, if you're talking to somebody for five to 10 times or 10 to 20 times, at some point it gets old. You know, where they're interested, but they're not sure. And you know, I, I, I'm, the older I get, I seem to have less patience. Uh, so that's part of the process too. Raising money is not easy, as you know. And um, 
folks who are putting out reports and, and trying to hold folks in, in power accountable don't have a huge amount of time to just do this all the time. The real exciting part is investigating the bastards. And so, so the process should be fairly humane. I mean, I have to say a lot of foundations will put you through the ringer. And, you know, there's one I won't name where you can go through 10 meetings and two or three years before they give a grant. And they're just, they're, they're really don't understand why they can't give their money away. They, they have all this money they meant to give it away, they just can't seem to give it away. Well, they should just, like, give it out, you know? I mean, like, I can help them out eventually, you know? But, uh, yeah, so I did, probably didn't help you much with the answer, but it, it's, it's a great question. We have another question right. from the blogosphere. We're going to have to stop calling it that. I just okay. like saying that word. <laughs> Do you foresee any organizations transforming themselves into nonprofits in the coming years, given that their for-profit models are dying? Um, well, as you're probably aware, the Baltimore Sun um, <clears throat> was working with a senator from Maryland to possibly have legislation passed that would enable them to transform into a nonprofit. Some of the L3C discussion of low pro but of combining for-profit nonprofit together as one corporation emanates from existing newspapers that want to have some investors who have some ownership shares in so-called low profit folks who maybe would settle instead of for 50% annual profits as they did have at one time to maybe just, I don't know, five or 10%. Um, uh, so uh, the Baltimore Sun was one publication that was talked about. Another one, of course, that's been written about a lot is the New York Times because uh, there was a, f a famous or infamous, depending on your perspective, uh, editorial in the New York Times saying that the foundation should throw down something like two billion dollars or a few billion dollars and throw off an annual amount that would pay for the New York Times to be published every year. It's written by two Yale um, professors, I think. And uh, the New York Times never said it was remotely interested in what I just said, but, it, but <laughs> I'm saying that there has been discussion about transforming and using nonprofit money you know, the PBS and NPR model that happened in some of our, in the room, some of our lifetimes, uh, just 40 years ago, we created two very significant institutions out of thin air and uh, funded by viewers and listeners like you, uh, you know, for 40 years. And so and we have uh, no financial challenges at all. No, no, I know, I know. <laughs> no, it's true. But, you know, it, it actually has worked. I mean, we actually lose sight. Uh, you know, that was an amazing thing to have done that. And could I, would I like there to be more investigative reporting in the realm of PBS and NPR? Um, I would. And uh, it, do I think that's starting to change, or at least with NPR? I do, actually. I'm impressed with the, the new regime there. And, uh, and we're active with Frontline. But there needs to be more in that sphere. And you could say, well, is it because they it, uh, have had government money to some extent or because of the political nature of CPB, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, that they are pull their punches. Um, gosh, that's a really loaded subject. Let's, uh, let's try to... That'd be a different conference. That would be a different <laughs> conference. Yeah, that, thank you. I've been, I've been uh, saved there. Thank you. Uh, I won't go there. But yeah, there are some that think the answer might be possibly in the affirmative there. Uh, I don't... I mean, what do I know? I'm just passing through here. Um, uh, other... <laughs> I saw a number of hands go up. Back in the center? Yeah. Hello, uh, Phil Jader, Winston-Salem State University. Um, in terms of finances, is the thought that there aren't enough small donors, $35 donors, to pay the freight for the operation, and this is why you need the bigger donors with the deeper pockets? Uh, it's a great question. Um, well, that's what actually not to say one more thing, NPR and, and PBS, but especially NPR, what makes NPR interesting is they have developed uh, millions of small donors, but it took them 40 years to do it. Um, I, uh, I had a kind of a, this, I have a little anecdote that will tell you what I think of this question, I mean, the answer to this question. Um, I have a development director who helped me raise that 30 million I mentioned, but at one point she said, she's wonderful, Barbara Schechter, um, she said, uh, Chuck, you know, we got to get more small donors and I said I agree let's get small donors and she says well we're gonna to have to invest one or two hundred thousand dollars in uh, direct mail and I go direct mail god I hate direct mail 
And she said, well, everyone uses direct mail. And I go, what's the percentage? And she goes, well, if you send out 100 letters, maybe you'll get one back. And I go, one? And, and um, so we started doing this. But, you know, we weren't curing cancer here. We we're, just, we're just trying to hold people in power accountable, but it's not the same as curing cancer. You know, so we were getting one back, but it was just going okay, and we were hemorrhaging money. I mean, we were spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to get up to six to 10,000 donors or something like that. So one day, uh, uh, you can tell I wasn't cut out to do this stuff. Um, one day, she comes to me with these consultants, and they said, because they know that I'm a pain in the neck about some of this stuff. They said, Chuck, um, we want to raise our percentage, and um, they, we think that what we'd like to do is telemarketing. And I said, I beg your pardon? And they said, well, we want to call people in the evening around dinner time and tell them to read their letters that they haven't responded to. And I go, you want the Center for Public Integrity to do telemarketing? <laughs> and I, I said, get the hell out of my office. I mean, I, and that was the end of direct mail. We didn't do it ever again. <laughs> That, that's not necessarily a good story, but, I, but what I'm saying is it is really hard to get small donors. Now, what's exciting now is uh, with uh, some of the political campaigns in the last six, eight years, and we all know that you know, now you can get millions of donors uh, who are giving small amounts on the web, but, I, but in the philanthropic realm as opposed to the political realm, that has not it has started, everyone's got donate buttons and, you know, you, you do try to get traffic. And at one point last year, the Center for Public Integrity was, was making uh, 25000 a month from small donations. People just like the reports and send in money. So that's great. Uh, but their annual budget is close to $5 million. So you do the math. I mean, they're not going to, they will build up a bevy of, of supporters the way, like you're asking. But it is really painstaking. It takes a lot of time. And the web is the... I think does offer great hope, but the philanthropic realm is nowhere near the political realm in how to how to electrify the public and turn that into support. So, thank you, um, Chuck. Um, I, my name is Steve Barry, and I have a um, sort of a nuts and bolts question because I'm in a very nuts and bolts situation as I'm trying to establish a new nonprofit um, organization that we're calling the Iowa Center for Public Affairs Journalism. Um, you mentioned a while ago that, that part of the important part of maintaining your integrity and your credibility is to separate the fundraising from the journalism. Um, and, and as someone who's going to be doing the fundraising, and I will be doing the journalism. I will be in the nuts and bolts editor's chair editing stories and, and writing stories on my own. Do you, and did you have a problem in, in doing that when you're out soliciting donations? And you, could you offer us some suggestions on how you negotiate that? Do you do, are you as, for example, are you up front from the very outset uh, explaining your independence and how you have to maintain that journalistic uh, independence, or do you sort of, I, I don't know, what do you sort of let it come up on its own, or what? No, it, it's a great question, uh, we, and we talked about this last night a little bit. Um, there is one rule of thumb is, as I sort of alluded, but not as clearly today, is to um, only, uh, it should be your idea you should have an interest in looking at whatever the subject is. It should really emanate from you, not from them. You shouldn't, you, sh you should really tr try desperately not to pander to where the money is, and a, a plant growing towards the light kind of thing. Uh, you'll, start to, you'll start to feel like you are doing somebody else's bidding, or at least that you're doing projects that didn't organically start with you. So it should be things you think need to be investigated as a journalist. And then uh, you should then try to find sources of funding that, that care about it. There happen to be a million or more, I don't know the numbers, but they're huge, of foundations and individual donors and family foundations and large foundations. And this research is done where we know exactly who they fund, what they fund, subject areas they care about. It's, it's in, their, in their websites or in other directories. So the research on this is not hard to find, and it's, on, it's easily accessible on the web. 
But um, another thing is, and I didn't mention this earlier, uh, you absolutely positively under no circumstance show any donor the copy in the course. I mean, that's your, this is a sacred newsroom situation where only the professionals are dealing with a copy. They, and that's, again, it sounds really basic, but you know, I'm not sure some of the groups out there that sound journalistic today not the 30 I mentioned, I'm talking about some others. I, I think that's not always the case, you know, where they're s sending drafts around. I, I don't really know what they're doing, but I think that's an important, it sounds really basic, but it's, it's essential. Uh, and the other, the other part is it's harder, this question and this issue is much harder at the beginning, unfortunately, because the founder is, is forced to do both simultaneously, especially, I mean, when I was running a staff of 40 people and 100 journalists in 50 countries on a contract basis, at the end, it was really hard for me to start really do much journalism myself and my own things. I went, I was writing parts of chapters and stuff, but it wasn't the kind of reporting I had done in the first part of the center's evolution. The problem with that is that um, sometimes these nonprofits are one person <laughs> right now. You know, you have one or two hundred thousand or a hundred thousand from a grant, you've got one person out there. This has becomes a this is a, a very personal thing that that person, whoever it is, is usually is a person of credibility and reputation. Most of these nonprofits are started by credible journalists. That means that you've got to find a way to talk to donors, make sure you do state your independence. Some groups put it on the website as part of their donor their development policy. We accept money from these groups and not these groups. And of course, we are independent. We do not publish what people tell us. We do not show them a copy. I mean, you have that. That's another standard that can be urged, I think, officially on all groups. Uh, it's very spotty. You heard how spotty it is with just the 990s, where most of them don't put them up on their website. What I just described is not on that many websites. But it comes down to uh, the golden gut, basically your trust and your instincts. You know, if you, you know, I've been in situations where I wanted to take a shower as soon as I left, and, uh, and I didn't take the money. You know, I, I could give you lots of examples, uh, um, but we would be here all day talking. Uh, you know, and you, you, you make a decision that that's kind of creepy, not sure I want to be doing that, it looks bad, it feels weird, that person has an agenda, and we're not, we don't need to do that, and it's not something I want to do, and you know, that kind of thing. You've got to go, it's basically trusting your instincts, the same as a reporter trusts their instincts. You decide ultimately what to write after all said and done. You listen to everybody, and then you make your decision. Well, you do the same thing with donors. Some donors stay away from. Some donors are respectable, credible folks. I mean, most of the donations today, 142 million given since 2005 for journalism and news initiatives in America, not counting public broadcasting. That's according to Jan Schaefer and JLab. These, these monies are coming not from media foundations mostly now. They're coming from community, local foundations. Why? Because local donors realize there's a civic crisis. You can't have a democracy without an informed citizenry. And we have a, a very serious civic crisis here where the public doesn't really know or care that much in many cases about what's going on. They, they can't get the information if they do want to find it. And so they're now stepping into journalism for the first time. And the question is, how long will they step in? <laughs> will they stay there for 10, 20, 30 years? They have with NPR and PBS for the most part. I mean, and the Center for Public Integrity is, Get, is celebrating its 20th anniversary this year. Um, so I think this, this is here to stay, but um, the civic crisis is a, is a real one, and that's why there are donors that just think there's a problem out there and we need information. B bless their hearts, you know. <laughs> I wish they were all like that, back to your ideal do donor uh, scenario. Well, we have about Sorry. two minutes. <laughs> if there's a question that could be answered in two minutes. Oh, well, I'll Byron. try to be more brief there. Thank you. Oh, sorry. I'm Byron Knight, uh, formerly with Wisconsin Public Broadcasting. Um, I have a question. You've mentioned Frontline a couple times and NPR and websites and publishing. Do you think there are different standards depending on how you publish your investigative report? Is broadcasting different than written, different than websites? Uh, unfortunately, yes, is the short answer. Um, I'm doing a project about great moments in journalism in the last 60 years, high-def video, interviews with iconic journalists that I've collected. And I've got a whippersnapper, young masters in film person who uh, wants to lay in all kinds of special effects and 
music, and not just music. I, I, when I was at 60 Minutes, you couldn't use music even. But, you know, all this other stuff, you know, I'll spare you. And then there's a broadcast journalist who was a producer of two networks, not me, another person I work with. And, and those, that line has changed since the 80s to now, even about, like, using music, for example. That's a new thing that's changed. And then the web, which has no standards, essentially. And, and uh, we're doing something that's going to involve video, famous journalists who were the icons in our profession, and it's on the web. So which standard do we go by? Do we do the broadcast journalism standard? Do we do the web standard? Do we do the film standard, the auteur? Ooh, that's so beautiful. Um, and... <laughs> And I'm trying to find, uh, basically I'm going to do a conservative thing that I'm not allowing any artificial sound effects, and I, but it'll be cool looking on the web. And you know, it, we're going to do it in a way that we're, will be respectful and, and credible, I think. But you've got, you got a great point. The, all those lines, are, all that sand is shifting under our feet. It's unfortunate, but it's, it's undeniable. Okay, I've, I've been told we can go for one more quick one. First, I congratulate you on not using the word freedom in your name or all the money in the world would come to you. <laughs> and then That's what true. can we learn? There is, as you've mentioned, electronic media, but there is a print example in Vanity Fair. Vanity yeah. Fair has done the most outstanding job the past year in financial reporting so us yeah. lay people can figure out the debacle of what happened. What can we learn from that? Because it's a traditional print media and Right. The eyeballs are all over Vanity Fair, every issue. No, I, I, I love Vanity Fair, and we're working with Barlett and Steele, who are two writer, great iconic journalists at the workshop. Actually, we're going to do a two-year project, but I'm a huge fan of Vanity Fair. They are the McClure's of our time, uh, but we forget. What did McClure do with Lincoln Stephens and Ida Tarbell in, in 1900? The same thing Vanity Fair is doing. They, they have a lot of celebrity glitzy stuff that has absolutely nothing to do with journalism that brings people to the magazine, several hundred thousand, and they have amazing advertising uh, because of the traffic coming there, the actual magazine itself. And then they lace in wonderful journalism about the financial crisis by these iconic journalists who they can afford to pay good salaries and, or at least contract fees. That's the model. So investigative reporting for uh, uh, actually a century, including television like 60 Minutes where I was, is we'll do investigative reporting, but we'll give it to you in just little bitty pieces because it costs a lot of money, and we, we, we're not sure how much of it you can stomach. So, uh, <laughs> so we'll do the, the profile of so-and-so. I mean, and that's the model that the commercial media has always followed, and the problem with that is uh, six minutes does 110 segments a year and five or ten are investigative and most of those they got from newspapers they didn't actually do themselves that's not good we need to we need to generate original investigative reporting from the ground up all over the country in every county and city and and uh, it's not happening right now so that's the problem it, it's a great idea and I wish we could have 20 vanity fairs and I wish it was not all that other junk just the good stuff but uh, I'm not exactly typical uh, I mean about that. So, thank you, thank you. Charles Lewis. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. <laughs>